Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for the Bicentennial Alliance Lecture Series. My name is Melanie Keeney, and I am the Director of Engagement and Outreach here at Missouri s and and today I will serve as your host and moderator. Missouri s and is currently celebrating its 150th anniversary, coinciding with Missouri's Bicentennial celebration. As a way to honor Missouri's Bicentennial, s and is hosting a series of lectures titled Honoring Our Past and Envisioning the Future, Missouri s and Lecture Series for the Bicentennial. This series celebrates the rich cultural history of our region and explores social, social and economic growth topics relative to Missourians. Today, we present our next lecture titled Missouri's German Heritage. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a couple of things. Today's speaker, Dr. DeWitt, will welcome your questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A box. The chat function is disabled. Questions will be asked in the order in which they are received. Um, as a thank you for your participation in today's lecture, we will be giving away a um, prize bag full of um, different um, items, including 150, Missouri's 150th celebration items, bicentennial items, and a copy of Dr. Larry Gragg's book, Forged in Gold. The winner of this drawing will be notified via email, and we will announce the winner at the end of today's lecture. And um, at that time, we'll collect that email information from that winner. So with that, I would like to now welcome our speaker. Our speaker is Dr. Petra DeWitt, an alumni of UMR, now Missouri s and She earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in history in 1996, a Master of Arts in History from Truman State in Kirksville, Missouri, and a PhD in history from the University of Missouri in Columbia. Dr. DeWitt joined Missouri s and history department in 2003 and has been teaching courses such as Making of Modern Germany, Historiography, and World War I, A Global Perspective. Her research interests are the treatment of German Americans during World War I and the American home front during World War I. Her book, Degrees of Allegiance, Harassment and Loyalty in Missouri's German American Community During World War I, won the 2012 Book Award from the State Historical Society of Missouri. And with that, Dr. DeWitt, I turn this over to you. Okay, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to talk here at my university about the German heritage in Missouri. So I hope you learned something new and I look forward to all of your questions at the end of my presentation. German immigrants have been coming to Missouri since the early 1800s. Some like Gottfried Duden stayed for only a brief moment in the 1820s and published in German states his encounter with his experiences here in Missouri. And what you see on the left side of your screen is the cover of his um, book, Bericht über die Eisen nach den westlichen Staaten Nordamerikas. And uh, he talks quite favorably of the state of Missouri, which sadly some <laughs> other Germans who followed him because of his book realized, wait a minute, it gets hotter in the summer than he's talking about. It gets colder in the winter than what he's talking about, but they stayed nevertheless. But he is a person who really inspired other Germans to come to Missouri. And that is really a story that is prevalent throughout the migrations by Germans into Missouri. They knew of somebody else who had been here before them, be it somebody like Godfrey Duton, be it a friend, be it a cousin, but they already knew something about the state before they ever set foot in the state. Others followed in the 1830s, including Friedrich Münch, who was a Lutheran minister living in a principality where the king was not Lutheran, and that was usually problematic. Um, what we need to remind ourselves of is that Germany did not exist as one single country in the early 19th century. Instead, this was a conglomeration, the leftovers from the Holy Roman Empire 
this conglomeration of principalities, individual city states, kingdoms uh, that uh, had in common more or less a dialect of German. Okay, so the people come for various reasons to um, to Missouri. Friedrich Munch is one of those who actually organized a um, immigration society. So they all would invest uh, almost like a stock company into this immigration society. They would pool resources and uh, they would pick a place where they were supposed to settle as a community. But as happened in so many stories, they would break apart as soon as they made it to American soil and go in different directions. Now, why did people come? Um, uh, the majority of people came for economic reasons. Why economic reasons? Um, this is the time period of the early industrialization in the Germanic states. Industrialization had originated in uh, Great Britain on the European continent, and then after Napoleon begins to spill over into Central Europe. So you have, for example, as the image on your right shows, mechanization of harvesting, mechanization of um, planting happening. As a result, you have overproduction which can be a good thing because if you have overproduction, prices actually decline, which is fabulous for the consumer, right? Not so fabulous for the farmer because the farmer is no longer making uh, enough to survive. So what happens, and as is shown on the left side of your screen, is that farming households take in what is called cottage industry. So that in addition to producing crops in the fields, they're producing other things, be it um, uh, children weaving baskets, for example, or children putting little needles into carts that would then be sold for sewing uh, purposes, or little nails will be put into these uh, little carts that will be so sold to carpenters and so on. So they're trying to supplement their income. What makes this even worse is some of the inheritance practices that existed. Again, they are different from state to principality to kingdom. And in uh, some of these principalities, you have primogenitor, meaning that only the oldest son will inherit whatever plot of land the family owns. That means the remaining sons have nothing else to look forward to except to perhaps go into the military, the clergy, or to pack up and leave. Uh, in some of the principalities, you have inheritance laws where every son gets an equal part of the farm. And that means that the parcels they inherit become smaller and smaller and smaller over time. And that provides little opportunity for survival in the future. While the opportunity to take in work, cottage industry can supplement the income by the 1820s, 1830s, it's no longer enough for most families to survive. So the easiest thing is then to just sell what you have, pool that money and buy a ticket to leave to go somewhere else because you already know somebody else who's been there. OK, so some these are some of the decisions that families make and they make them as a family unit, not as individuals necessarily but most often as a family unit. And what we see in the 1830s in particular is that German immigrants arrive as whole families. So you have the husband, the wife, the children. Sometimes you have grandparents, sometimes you have grandchildren coming along as well, okay? So uh, that is really part and parcel of that movement. That changes a little bit in the 1840s and 1850s because of political revolutions that happened in uh, Germany. While economics is still a very important factor, uh, in 1848, these economic factors have actually led to revolution, not just in the Germanic states, but also in France and uh, other countries in 1848. And they even attempted to unify all these German principalities into one under the Frankfurt Parliament. Uh, the effort, however, was short-lived and uh, in essence, the whole thing fails. And the so-called revolutionaries then um, are being driven out of the Germanic states 
And they include individuals, as you see on the right side, like Friedrich Hecker and uh, Gustav Struber, who will be moving to Missouri. Other famous individuals who were part of that 1848 revolution who become political exiles or political refugees include on the left side, Franz Siegel, who will become extremely famous during the American Civil War. He will rise to the rank of general and uh, fight on the Union side. On the right side, you see Carl Schurz, who um, yes, was part of the revolution, but then uh, we'll be moving to Missouri, in particular St. Louis, and published the Westliche Post, which was the premier German language newspaper uh, in the nation um, after the American Civil War. So uh, you have these famous individuals coming. Here is, for example, an image of the Westliche Post. This newspaper room looks quite different than what you would imagine a um, a press to look. But one thing that these German immigrants, especially these so-called 1848ers, pride themselves in is free thinking. Uh, you can debate any and all issues, any political issues. That's what they would define as liberalism, totally different meaning than what we associate, associate with it today, right? So the freedom to express your opinion, the freedom of the press, that you can freely express your thoughts about things like slavery, for example, and the majority of uh, the German immigrants who come in the 1840s and 1850s are really outspoken against the institution of slavery. And uh, that includes uh, this individual, Henry Bornstein, who published the Neue Anzeiger des Westens, which was actually the very first uh, German language newspaper west of the Mississippi River. Um, uh, but it would soon be supplanted by uh, the Westliche Post. And uh, he, he, he was almost an abolitionist and uh, to the point of really speaking out against slavery. Uh, why were they so opposed to slavery? They compared it to serfdom. Serfdom was just coming to an end on the European continent, right? So serfdom means that you as an individual are assigned to land and the Lord who owns the land. And he, uh, in essence, has absolute power over you. And these German immigrants view this slavery slash serfdom as inhibiting, limiting uh, the liberal ideals of on, on what the United States was founded on. Okay, so uh, if you look at your Bill of Rights, uh, the first few amendments attached to the Constitution, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, uh, these German immigrants were really afraid that these concepts were under attack by slavery, that if slavery were allowed to spread across the United States, then all these freedoms would come to an end. So many of these German immigrants, like Schwartz, like Bornstein, viewed themselves as being at the forefront of making sure that these American principles or universal, universal principles of freedom should be protected from the encroachment of slavery. So it should be no surprise that uh, these German immigrants would also be very much deeply involved in the American Civil War. But before I get to that, I want to talk a little bit about who were those migrants? Where did, I mean, what was their background? Uh, these were not destitute peasants, but they were those who still had something that they could lose in the German principalities. So they could turn what they had in the principalities, in the homeland, into cash, into capital that could be invested over here, be it that they would invest it in establishing their own business, or be it uh, buying land to farm, okay? So they included farmers, but they also included the educated like uh, journalists, judges, physicians, professors, you have skilled craftsmen, um, you also have unskilled laborers. They all are looking for economic and social improvement, not necessarily political fortunes like um, Carl Schurz would, for example. A sizable number of these German immigrants moved to cities like St. Louis. Uh, often St. Louis became the first stop before somebody would else move on to land. 
um, but they're looking for economic opportunity, better wages, ownership of their own business. So skilled workers would include carpenters, coopers, shoemakers, tailors, bakers, brewers, of course, <coughs> excuse me, stonemasons, bricklayers, any, any trade that you can think of is represented, okay? And uh, they really fill the high demand for those skills in the United States. The United States at that time period is only in the early industrial revolution, whereas the German states rapidly transition into the more industrial revolution based upon coal, iron, uh, and steel, okay? So here in Missouri, as a craftsman, you still have opportunities, whereas in the Germanic states, your opportunities are increasingly declining. So people are looking at this dichotomy, you know, here I have opportunity, here I don't. So the pull factor to, to come to the United States is very, very strong, okay? We also then have, uh, so St. Louis is more or less the first stop, but then if you imagine the map of Missouri, so here's St. Louis, then a lot of Germans go along the Missouri River. There's this, you know, almost um, mythical association with the Rhine River, although most of the immigrants didn't come from the Rhine Valley, okay? But that's a myth that has been created over the years that the hill country along the Missouri River looks so very similar to the Rhine River Valley. And others moved along uh, the Mississippi River uh, to establish settlements there as well. Okay, so they are the ones that had the most to lose. But we also have the story of religious refugees. Um, I don't necessarily want to call them refugees. Uh, they were not necessarily persecuted to the point that uh, their lives were literally threatened. It's that kings and princes still had absolute power over what religion was the original religion within a kingdom, within a principality or uh, a city state. And if you were of a different religion, life could be problematic, difficult, because if you are Catholic living in a Lutheran principality, because the prince says everybody should be Lutheran, then you're missing out on opportunities. You're not going to get the right kind of education. You're not going to get the right kind of apprenticeship and uh, you are not going to get a trade license. So economically speaking, your faith being different from that of the prince would have consequences. So people would feel, well, we'll go to the country where there is religious freedom, okay? And we have a sizable group of Lutherans who came from Saxony and they followed Martin Stefan, and they settled in Eastern Perry County and established communities like Frona, Wittenberg, Altenburg, Johannesburg. And what set them apart is their focus on education. And what you see in front of you, and uh, this is the actual original building, um, is a schoolhouse. A schoolhouse or a log cabin seminary that offered classes in languages, in philosophy, in music, in math, in science, of course, in religion and in drawing. But this is an education that your average rural American would not be receiving. So um, not only did the Lutherans come for religious freedom, but they also were very much focused on providing opportunity for their students. And the way you do that is through education, okay? So this little log cabin seminary would become the seed for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. One member of this group, CFW Walter, helped found Concordia Seminary and the Missouri Synod. So this definitely has a long-term impact upon uh, Missouri as well as the country as a whole, okay? Um, majority of the people would eventually wind up in uh, rural settings, would be setting up farmsteads because that's where they had come from in the German principalities, right? 
And some of the educated who came along with the more common Germans, uh, they held a kind of almost utopian ideal of the farmer um, who conducts husbandry, right? Um, he uses his hands to get his hands dirty in the soil and uh, brings forth nourishment out of that soil. So it's a super idealized version of farming rather than realizing, wait a minute, this is backbreaking work. You're up from sun sunrise to sunset, it literally is going to hurt your back and you're not always going to produce the things that, that you want to, especially if you're trying to get into exotic plants. These farmers were called the Latin farmers because they all could speak Latin, okay? They had the appropriate kind of education. But most ordinary farmers would be building farmsteads like this. Uh, this is the Pelster farm or barn, um, Pelster barn in Franklin County, and it shows you a transplantation of a farm life, farm, farming way of life from a German principality upon the American soil. And in essence, what, <coughs> excuse me, the building is, is cohabitation between animals and the family. And what you would see here on the left side, this, this great opening, um, you would be closing it during winter. And down here, the critters are living. So the milk cow is down here. Uh, the chickens could be roosting down here. Perhaps you have a hog or two down here, perhaps also a steer or something, or a couple of horses, draft horses, and so on. And the idea is these animals give off heat, right? And heat rises, right? So they add a, an important function during winter. So you don't have to use as much fuel to heat the house or the barn um, as you would without the critters downstairs, okay? Up top, you actually have the loft. Uh, in, the, in the summer, this is empty, so you have good air movement through it, right? But in harvest time in the fall, hay is going to be stored there for winter season. So what you have is automatic insulation on top so that the heat does not escape, right? So uh, a lot of the German farmers who came here in the 1830s and 1840s and 1850s built uh, such house barns, and we just have a couple of them left over right now, okay? Um, German heritage in the American Civil War. What was the role of the Germans during that American Civil War? Um, most historians agree that the Germans in Missouri played a crucial role in keeping Missouri in the Union, okay? Um, uh, yes, there are examples of German immigrants owning one or two slaves, but they were few and far between. Okay, uh, as I already explained, uh, German immigrants were very much opposed to slavery. They viewed it as an attack on the American liberal institutions. Some of the reasons why these Germans were coming over to the United States. And in 1861, pro-Union St. Louisans and anti-slavery Germans then acted out their beliefs by getting into a conflict with pro-secession Missourians. So what's the background in Missouri in 1861? Missourians had elected a Democratic governor, Claiborne Fox Jackson, who had pro-Southern leanings. The state overall had also voted for Stephen Douglas, who was a uh, Democrat, but a pro-Union Democrat. So he carried Missouri, okay? But St. Louis is different. St. Louis voted for Republicans, including Abraham Lincoln. And the reason that was happening is because so many of the German immigrants were still living in St. Louis. And they expressed their discontent with slavery by voting for Abraham Lincoln, who opposed the expansion of slavery westward. So by the time Jackson gets sworn in, in, in into office in 1861, South Carolina has already seceded from the Union 
And Jackson now calls for a state convention because he wants to make sure that he has the backing of Missourians should the legislature decide to secede from the union just like South Carolina had done. To his surprise, however, Missourians voted for pro-slavery non-secessionists. <laughs> In other words, these were delegates to a convention who supported slavery, but did not support breaking the United States apart, okay? And um, Governor Jackson now sees a problem. And uh, he feels that, he thinks that the Missouri ought to be seceding. He secretly negotiates with the Confederacy to perhaps bring some weapons up to Missouri. But he also knows that he needs to take over the U.S. armory in St. Louis. And for that purpose, he orders the building of Camp Jackson in St. Louis so that we have that they have access to the armory, get those weapons, and then perhaps eventually force Missouri militarily to secede from the Union. That, however, becomes a problem because uh, Captain Nathaniel Lyon has recently arrived at Jefferson Barracks. And when, um, and, and, and in May of uh, 1861, Captain Lyon, in essence, decided to surround Camp Jackson. So Nathaniel Lyon has a few regulars from Jefferson Barracks, but he also has home guards organized by Frank Blair, and these home guards are predominantly German immigrants, okay? So you have about 6,000 regular Union troops plus these German home guards surrounding Camp Jackson, and Camp Jackson falls rather quickly. There is only about 900 of the pro-Confederate men in there. You can see the 6,000 versus 900. There was hardly any way that they were gonna win this, right? And Lyon uh, decides to march these Confederates down to the armory to have them charged with treason, what have you. But as they are walking down the streets to actually get to the armory, what you have developing is a riot. And uh, that includes uh, pro-secession St. Louisans, Missourians, who are throwing every cuss word under the sky at these German immigrants who seem to be interfering with the natural path of which Missouri was supposed to go. Of course, in their minds, it was supposed to go pro-secession. Right. And um, 28 people die that day. Three Germans are actually killed the following day. So there is clearly an ethnic undertone to the entire situation happening here. OK. But the actions by the Germans with Captain Lyon, who eventually becomes general and is killed at uh, at uh, Springfield um, later that year, clearly kept the state of Missouri in the Union, okay? So the Germans had a huge impact here. So what about the German heritage after the American Civil War? There's a major change happening in uh, migration patterns. We see more and more young individuals, young men, young women, uh, men who might be working in factories or in mines women who often work as domestics or also in factories, so they're no longer coming as uh, family units. Uh, we also see a change happening in citizenship. German immigrants who arrived prior to the American Civil War usually very quickly applied for and gained US citizenship, so they really wanted to stay forever. Whereas these young individuals who came after the Civil War uh, usually would fill out their first paper, which is the intent to become a citizen, but then would not follow through with what's called the second papers, which would gain them the full citizenship. So they would just let it lay on the, uh, on the, uh, on the side and uh, would never really become full citizens of the United States. Indeed, by 1875, we also see an uptick in young men returning to Germany because they see the social programs implemented by Bismarck as a 
positive development in, uh, in Germany, which by then, of course, has become an empire, because they don't have pensions in the United States at the time. They don't have health insurance at the time. They don't have accident insurance in the United States, whereas such insurance now existed in Germany. So if you're earning about the same wages in Germany versus the United States, but have these social programs, a lot of these young gentlemen decide that they want to go back to Germany rather than stay here. But these Germans nevertheless had an economic impact. And of course, the most obvious economic impact that might come to mind is the wine industry, right? So what you see here is an image of George Hoosman, who is considered the father of Missouri's wine industry. He arrived in the late 1830s. Um, and uh, he realized that uh, the Norton grape, uh, a natural native grape here in North America, actually made pretty good wine. And he did not just produce wine, he also wrote about wine production, okay? And he and others uh, who learned alongside with him or because of him, they cultivated the, the native grapes, the Catawba grape, the Norton grape, the Isabella grape, the Concord grape. So the wine that they were producing here in Missouri and eventually that spread throughout the United States is very different from the wine that they may have grown up with in the Germanic states from where they came, okay? By the 1870s, Missouri had 120 wineries. Uh, they were the wine producing state in the nation and names like Preschel, Teubner, <coughs> excuse me, and Langendorfer were known throughout the nation as a whole. On the right, you will see a, an image from 1890. This is Stonehill Winery and its proud employees. Of course, my, most of you probably said, well, the most famous industry was not wine industry. It was the beer industry. But before I get there, one more thing. Uh, this is Edward Kemper uh, in his vineyard uh, near Herman, Missouri. Uh, he created the Herman grape nurseries that shipped grape stock cuttings from, from his plants throughout the United States as well as in Europe. Indeed, and not everybody knows this, in the late 1900s, France was running into problems with a fungus that attacked the French grapevines. And it is cuttings from Kemper's vineyards that help the French wine industry to survive that, uh, that, that fungus attack, okay? So, uh, Missouri has, you know, comes full circle, right? These Germans come from Europe to the United States, and now the wine that they produce in the United States makes it back to Europe to make sure that wine industry over there survives as well. Again, most of you thought beer industry, right? And uh, it begins, you know, rather slow. There's lots of uh, German brewers who are coming to cities like uh, St. Louis, including William uh, Lemp, uh, who um, establishes a brewery and uh, a saloon. And that often is the story. You start out small. But then, of course, <coughs> let me get a quick sip of water here. We have the famous story, right? There was a Bavarian brewery company in St. Louis. And Mr. Unhäuser bought this defunct brewery company. Mr. Anheuser had actually made initially money by operating a soap factory, it has nothing to do with alcohol. Um, <laughs> but when he had the opportunity to expand, he bought this uh, uh, defunct Bavarian brewery company and begins to turn it into the Anheuser and Company organization. Then after the American Civil War, he hires his son-in-law, Adolphus Bush, to take over. And of course, we know the rest of the story here, right? This becomes the famous Unhäuser Bush Company, although it's now being owned by Belgians. Anyways, um, just as a side note of you from Rala, um, Anhäuser Busch in the, in the 1870s actually had a distribution center right here in Rala, Missouri. And its superintendent, Ernst Soest, 
was also a German immigrant. Yes, even Rolla, Missouri had German population, okay? Um, but of course, the spirits industry is not the only industry that existed uh, in Missouri run by Germans. If you go down the Missouri River uh, to Washington, Missouri, there is the Missouri Meerschaum Corn Cob Pipe Factory that uh, employed thousands of people over the years. You also have an individuals like Franz Schwarza who comes to Washington, Missouri, and he produces something entirely different. He produces zithers, which is a musical instrument. And it became the factory in the, in the United States to produce that um, musical uh, instrument. Um, going back to um, St. Louis, we also have the establishment of the Wagner Electric Manufacturing Com Company by Herbert Wagner and Ferdinand Schwedtmann in 1891. This became a thriving uh, business uh, because they sold small alternating current motors for home appliances just at the right moment as electricity is uh, becoming available for more and more households. During World War I and again during World War II, the company actually retooled to manufacture shell casings and other military hardware. At uh, one point, 25% uh, of the employees were actually women. Uh, that's what they would be broadly advertising. But the company was also known as being strongly anti-union uh, that contributed to a lengthy worker strike in 1918. Um, changing industry uh, beyond manufacturing, German immigrants also had an impact on the chemical industry. Advert, uh, Edward Mallinckrodt, uh, he was born in Missouri to German immigrant parents, but these parents kept sending him back to Germany for an education, which actually a lot of American um, intellectuals would also do. They would be getting degrees in Germany because at the time period it was considered the best education to be gotten. And uh, he learned uh, chemistry and he came back and established uh, Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals. And uh, they produced things like Rodinol, which is a photographic developer. They also produced carbolic acid and medical narcotics. On the other side of the state in Kansas City, we have William Folker, who was born in Germany, who moved to the city and established a successful home furnishing company that supplied furniture, carpets, linoleum, window treatments, not just to Missourians, but to Kansans, to Oklahomans, and to Coloradans. But he was known for something else. He supported the needy. He supported education, the arts, health services, and many public projects in Kansas City. And he did this all so quietly that he was actually known as Mr. Anonymous, okay? So whatever he earned, he also gave away. Germans also had an impact on education, and this was actually through an American, Susan Blow, uh, the daughter of a wealthy St. Louis politician. She traveled wildly in Europe, and uh, she learned about Friedrich Froebel, who developed the concept of kindergarten where children learn languages, sciences, math through play, okay? And she brought that concept back and uh, instituted the very first kindergarten in the United States in the Pear School in Carondelet in 1873. She also heavily published about Friedrich Ferbel's concepts, but her legacy or, or Friedrich Ferbel's legacy in the United States is that we still have kindergartens today. Germans also had an impact on uh, culture. Uh, they very much, as this photograph here or postcard um, shows, uh, believed in the concept of physical as well as intellectual perfection. Physical perfection you get through Turnvereine, where you do lots of gymnastics. But once you're done with all the heavy gymnastics, you then discuss political issues, philosophies, and what have you. So there would be lots of heavy debates. But you also have a number of organizations, clubs, Germania Verein, for example. Again, here comes an example from Rala that existed 
yeah, throughout uh, the German settlements in Missouri. Uh, they would have uh, get-togethers, they would have a leader crunch, in other words, a choir, so they would be singing songs. Um, they would have masquerade balls, for example, and um, uh, really represent their culture in front of all the other people in front of the Americans, okay? And that was okay, nobody said no to that, at, at least for a while. Politically speaking, there's also a German legacy Many German immigrants and their sons became active in the Republican Party throughout the state, as well as at the national level. Several, like Friedrich Munch, were elected to the Missouri Assembly. Others served as mayors, and you see Henry Overstoltz from St. Louis here. Richard Bartholt served as United States Representative from St. Louis between 1892 and 1915. But the most famous of them, politically speaking, was Carl Schurz who not only published the Westliche Post, but um, also served as United States Senator from Missouri between 1868 and 1878, and eventually served as Secretary of Interior under President Rutherford B. Hayes. Now, during World War I, there was a brief attack on German culture, German language, German-ness within the state, as well as the country as a whole. And there was really a serious attempt to get rid of any semblance of German, be it German language, German culture, what have you, because during World War I, that could be considered giving aid and support to the enemy. Could you really trust somebody who's speaking German on the street? Um, are they sharing secrets with somebody? Were they really American? And um, despite what some scholars have said, what I argue in, in the book that you already mentioned in, in, in your introduction is it all depends on where these Germans lived. In St. Louis, the community had become weak by World War I, by 1918. It's no longer a strong homogeneous community because Germans have moved into the suburbs. They've succeeded economically and they no longer needed the ethnic group for support, right? And uh, while you still have a few things surviving like a beer garden or uh, the Liederkranz, the choir, um, you're really not speaking that much German anymore. Whereas if you move along the Missouri River to cities like Herman or in Osage County to communities like Westphalia, there everybody is still speaking German, even beyond World War I, okay? Why? Um, because they're more homogeneous, right? That They're all ethnic Germans. They speak German. Um, the, the, the politicians, the, the mayor, uh, the sheriff, they're German. Americans, they're the descendants of German immigrants, right? So they have more control over how to keep any suggestions for taking German language into the underground or anything like that, so they can hold off any and all of these attacks, okay? So wrapping up this whole thing here, German, uh, Missouri's German heritage, uh, the legacy remains very strong. Uh, there are still communities that have genealogical societies today that trace their families' German heritage. Uh, the beverage industry, yes, there's foreign influence there as well, but it still is thriving, right? Uh, businesses may have renamed themselves during World War I, but they're still flourishing even today. Uh, many cities have strong sister programs, uh, sister city programs with German cities, right? And such things may have briefly come under attack in 1918 during uh, the First World War, but it all has survived, right? So while we're not necessarily speaking German in the streets anymore, we're still proud of our heritage, right? And heritage uh, tourism is extremely strong. Even Rala has a Chris Kindle market in uh, every December, right? And the Missouri Assembly actually authorized the creation of the German Heritage Corridor, which goes right along the Missouri River from Lafayette County in the west to St. Louis in the east, 
Yes, the settlements along the Mississippi River are not included in as well as Freistadt down in Lawrence County and, and, and others elsewhere. But it, it's a concept, right, that the Missouri Assembly is realizing that German immigrants have contributed heavily to the history, economy, culture of Missouri. Therefore, we ought to um, not only protect this area, but educate about this area, digitize records, German records uh, on a regular basis. And the Missouri Humanities Council is in charge of that. The next major digitization event is happening in Augusta. Um, is it the 30th of October that we're doing that? Um, so uh, it is a recognition, right, by the assembly that the German immigrants contributed heavily to the state's history. So I will stop here for now and entertain any and all questions and comments that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. DeWitt, for that very sure. insightful um, presentation on the German heritage. We do have some questions that have come in. The first question is, was there a brewing heritage in St. Louis before the arrival of the Germans? Was there a what heritage? Brewing. Oh, oh, brewing beer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't really know if anybody else, uh, in other words, uh, were there some Irish who, who, uh, that, who were brewing beer? I don't know if they were or were not. Um, uh, so th that's actually a very good question. I did, you know, everybody says it's the Germans who bring it to St. Louis, but it might be something worth digging into. Yeah. Great. Your next question is, are there groups that are working to preserve and remember the state's German heritage? And if so, how are they doing it? Um, uh, for one, it, okay, there are several genealog genealogical societies in uh, St. Louis. Um, Herman, the Gascony County Historical Society and Archives are preserving their records. Um, and then there's, of course, the, the heritage, um, the corridor um, through the activities with the Missouri Humanities Councils. It's, it's a humanities council that is charge of digitizing uh, the history. Uh, they want to also place historical markers so that um, when people come visiting, be it cities like Herman, small towns like Westphalia, that they see not only those historical markers, but they can then use technology the, like their little phone and they take a picture of this little, I don't know what that's called, that little square thing. Um, and then it will show uh, the website. Uh, the website will have articles on it. The website will have additional images related to that very specific space. So those are some of the efforts that are underway for preserving uh, the German history of Missouri. Thank you. Our next question first starts out with, this has been outstanding. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> following, do you offer additional courses regarding German heritage at s and well, I, uh, only the making of modern Germany, although I'm also teaching World War I, which goes heavy into the Germans. I also teach um, uh, European migrations, which, all, which also spends some time on the Germans. So several of my courses actually provide information about German migrations. So I try to put it in there whenever I can. <laughs> Was there an influx of Jewish, Jewish Germans into Kansas City who established many viable businesses? Absolutely, and not just into Kansas City, but uh, throughout the state. Um, and I know that that is one group of Germans we often like, not like to, but we often overlook, right? Um, uh, after, after all, uh, Levi Strauss comes from Bavaria, right? Um, although he settled in California eventually. But yes, um, there's a sizable number of European Jews, German Jews, who also arrive in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s. Um, they settle in all sorts of communities, be it St. Louis, Kansas City, 
they established thriving businesses, they uh, set up thriving synagogues. And uh, then you have a second wave of Jewish immigrants coming. And those are the Orthodox Jews who actually arrived by about 1900, 1910 from Eastern Europe. And uh, you actually see competition between the two groups because the first group is well established. The second group is poor, less educated, um, uh, who, are, who are escaping persecution. And uh, the two often clash because one is more secular, the other is more orthodox. But World War I actually creates an opportunity for the two groups to come together um, because they both want to liberate um, <clears throat> the oppressed peoples in Europe, be it uh, the oppressed people under the Kaiser in Germany, or be it the oppressed people in Poland or in uh, the Ukraine and so on, right? So there's a unique history associated with uh, German Jewish migrations to Missouri as well. Thank you. Our next question. How does the German Heritage Corridor relate to the German Ark in Missouri? German art. Ark. Ark. Okay. Um, it represents it somewhat. It is part of it, but it does not entail the entire uh, German Ark. Okay. Um, uh, you have lots of settlements um, in the Midwest. Okay. Excuse me. In the in the Midwest, you have in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. I'm doing the map wrong again. Uh, Ohio, <laughs> Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, uh, going northward into uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and so on. And we're kind of here at the bottom with the Missouri River, right? And uh, it also goes down to the Mississippi River a little bit longer. But there are not that many Germans who are going into the southern states, A, because of slavery, um, and um, B, there are more industrial opportunities within the Midwest, okay? So um, with the corridor, it's, it's kind of like the bottom part of this entire, I call it more like a fan than, than an actual arc, okay? I hope that helps. All right, and the last um, question that I have, unless others enter a question while I ask this, sure. is more of a um, more of a statement. Um, the comment comes from the Missouri S and T archivist uh, Deborah Griffith, and she she says Susan Blow has an MSM connection. Oh, really? Missouri School of Mines. Her nephew Peter Blow was one of the duelists in our only campus duel. He survived and later during a campus baseball game coughed up the bullet that had lodged in his throat. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you for sharing that, Debbie. Yes, that was a, a, a neat way to kind of tie it up with a, <laughs> yeah. with a connection to, to campus and, yes. and everything you've discussed with us. Okay, so that um, concludes our questions for today. I'd like to, uh, do you have any final words, Dr. DeWitt? Or? Any, no, any, no, any? I enjoyed this, and I look. I mean, if anybody else wants wants to ask me questions, you know, do it p at mst.edu. So feel free to contact me. Thank you, and thank you everyone for participating in today's lecture. These this event was recorded and will be uploaded onto Missouri S and T's 150th celebration page, which can be found at 150.mst.edu. We did have a winner for our participation prize and that person is Sal Lin. Sal, if you can make sure and get your email address entered into the chat or the Q&A box, we'll make sure and uh, make arrangements for you to pick up that participation prize. Um, we'd also like to invite everyone back again on Wednesday, December 8th at 2 p.m. as we welcome our final Bicentennial Lecture Dr. John McManus, who is a Curator's Professor of History and Political Science here at Missouri s and and he will present Remembering Missouri's Most Famous Generals. And with that, thank you and everyone enjoy your day.
Bye-bye.